Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the July 28th public meeting of the Conservation and Natural Resources Advisory Council. Appreciate you all joining us today. And, uh, you know, I think uh, we've done this, I don't know how many times now, but always have glitches uh, to be able to get this thing started. So thank you for your patience uh, with us struggling to get uh, everything uh, up on the screen for you. I uh, apologize if you're seeing um, things pop onto my screen, but uh, the good news is perhaps we'll be back in person uh, for a September meeting. Uh, my name is Gretchen Leslie, and I am the senior advisor here at DCNR, and I'm the liaison to the Conservation and Natural Resources Advisory Council. Um, just a few housekeeping items up front before I do turn it over to our chairperson, Gerilyn Singer. Um, I want to remind everybody that um, audience members are muted. Uh, we do have a few speakers today who we will unmute to give public comment. Uh, council members, though, however, are free to turn on their cameras and their microphones to talk at any time uh, and ask questions of our um, uh, speakers today or of each other. Uh, certainly, that is all welcome. That dialogue is welcome. Uh, and the audience is muted, as I said, and we will unmute those audience members uh, who have asked to provide public comment. Uh, just a reminder that this session is being recorded for, for training and record keeping pur purposes. So uh, by participating in this, you are consenting to the recording uh, and the retention and use of this uh, session. So I'm just gonna run down some names for you, a bear with you of who is in attendance today. Uh, we do have um, expected in attendance uh, uh, our council members, Gerilyn Singer, who is our chairperson, uh, Bob Kirshner, who is our vice chair, uh, Meredith Graham, who's our secretary, uh, Rocco Ally, Sarah Hall Bagdonis, Silas Chamberlain, Greg Goldman, Gary Cribbs, Steve Stroman, Janet Sweeney, Pitt Theron, and Dave Trimpey uh, should be joining us today if they're not already on the line listening to us. Uh, Katrina Harris is our administrator and will be capturing minutes today for us. And as always, thank you to Air Bench for helping us run the behind the scenes WebEx. Um, we do have some uh, DCNR members with us today and some you'll be hearing from our secretary, uh, Cindy Adams Dunn. Uh, we also have uh, presenters, um, uh, Robert Young, who's with DEP's Energy Programs Office, and Nicole Faraguna from our policy office, who will be presenting on the solar in Pennsylvania here on the agenda. Uh, Eric Nelson, you'll hear from, who is our legislative um, uh, director. And um, you'll also be hearing from Chris Nicholas, who is our Susquehanna State Forest District Forester, who will update you a little bit on our ATV pilot uh, program. Um, I do want to read off some folks from the general audience that we had signed up for the meeting today. I can't guarantee that all of those folks are listening on the line at the moment, because I, I can't kind of multitask and see the, uh, the attendee list, but you will, uh, if you consult with the minutes um, that we'll post um, uh, later on in a few, after they're approved in a few months, you'll be able to see who the actual attendees are um, for this meeting. So I'm gonna read down these and apologies to uh, those names that I mispronounce. Um, uh, I'll just run through these quickly. Dave Hess, welcome back, Dave. Uh, Tyler Sender, Edward Stoddard, Harold DeWolf, Bob Shugart, Joseph Herbstrut, George Derwalker, Adrian Markosik, John Klein, Patrick Mack, Nate Regal, Eric Rensel, Marcy Mowry, Ellis Foley, Sarah Corcoran, John Lavelle, Randy Green, Linda Devlin, A. Almick, Angela Bro, Cliff David, Tom Case, Brian Chapman, Kimberly Eagle, Julie Brennan, Susan Morosky, Jim Jackson, William Finch, Emma Deal, Kirsten Vernon, Natalie Shear, Richard Allen, Robert Swift, Jennifer Dunlap, Ezra Thrush, Stephen Lane, Jonathan Geyer, Michael Roth, Ed Kojanzic, Clinton Ivins, Amy Shields, Andrew Lane, David Getchy, and Penny Piper. Um, so apologies if I mispronounced any names. Um, thank you all for joining us today. We certainly appreciate the attendance. I do think that this is one of the larger attend virtual meetings and uh, we do know that this uh, format allows people to attend by phone, uh, which is a lot easier than driving into Harrisburg uh, in the Rachel Carson building. 
Uh, so with that, I will now turn it over to uh, Gerilyn Singer, our chairperson for the Advisory Council, who will run us through the meeting. Gerilyn? Hi, thank you, Gretchen. Good morning and welcome to what may be our last WebEx virtual meeting for a while. Um, going forward, we will most likely have a hybrid of virtual and in-person meetings. But uh, so I have been so thankful that we have been able to meet virtually over these last 14 months. Again, a big thank you to Era, Gretchen, and the DCNR staff for making this happen. And a welcome to our public participants for joining us today. And thank you, fellow council members and our presenters for taking the time to be here and share information and ideas. Um, you may see some changes to our agenda by way of our public comment period. And we, as a council, were reviewing and looking at our format and structure of our meetings and thought it would be good to offer another opportunity for public comment. So today we are testing it out for the first time to see how things go at this meeting. We are offering two public comments, one at the beginning of the meeting for those who may want to offer comments centered around DCNR issues that are not officially on the agenda or presentations that are being made, just general comments. Um, and the important thing is we as council will not be engaging in any dialogue or discussion. It is simply an opportunity for our friends from the public to make comments to council members, um, and we will be listening to those comments from the citizen standpoint. We will again offer an opportunity at the end of our meeting for any of those that may want to make comments to council members regarding presentations or issues that were discussed during the meeting. And in order to stay within our allotted time and to also allow us to conduct our business, we will not engage in any discussion or dialogue, but listen and we will follow up with comments and thoughts following the meeting. Uh, our members felt that it was important that we provide these opportunities for the public, but that we also don't get off task and are able to conduct, conduct our business as well. We also have provided other avenues for public comment um, with a lot of public meetings in the past, and most recently our CONRAC conversations. And we will be continuing CONRAC conversations. You'll be hearing more about that as we move through the agenda. That again will be another vehicle to solicit public input. For those comments that are being made today, we do ask that you keep them to no more than five minutes. And I've been assigned the Timer police, so I'll be uh, just keeping making sure we stay on track with that. So with that, I believe we do have possibly two individuals that would like to offer some comments that are not related to our presentations today. And the one, uh, the first individual is Jerry Walls. And I'm not sure if Jerry is with us today or if he may have someone else sharing uh, remarks on his behalf. Is there anyone that um, is Jerry with us? I don't believe he is. Okay. And I don't know if George um, Durwalker is watcher is possibly presenting for him. And if I hear nothing, I'll just assume that we do not have have either one of them with us this morning. Okay. All right. So our second individual uh, is Stephen Lane, and he is from Downingtown. Stephen? Are we able to get Stephen unmuted? I 
I think I saw him listed as a participant. Era, are we able to unmute him or? Yeah, I don't hear her now. I'm muted. He is unmuted. <clears throat> Stephen, are you with us? That's I'm not sure from a. Hello. What? Hello, can you hear me now? Testing one, two, three. Is that Stephen? Hello. Is that Steven? Hello, Stephen? Are... Is that you? Let me see my. I don't know if you can hear me. Okay, thinking we're having some technical difficulty here. Um, let me try one more time. Stephen, are you able to hear us or hear me? All right. Well, I think. I think, Jalen, I think um... He can't hear us. We can hear him, but for some reason, he can't hear us telling um, him that we can hear him. Uh, the joys of WebEx. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, so, yeah, so um, maybe uh, so if we can put in chat uh, that to Stephen so he can see that, that we can, we can hear him. Um, but maybe we can circle back with him at the end of the um, meeting in the public comment period then. Okay. <clears throat> Let me just see. Okay. <clears throat> okay, well, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe in the interest of time, we can try to swing back. I don't know, is that something that can be fixed, ERA or Gretchen, or is it just a glitch with WebEx? It's on him. We can hear him just fine. It's his end. Okay. All right. I don't know if you maybe can. If, yeah, maybe if he can, um, you know, log out and log back in, maybe, maybe it'll work. Um, we'll give another shot here uh, um, later on in the agenda. Okay. All right. We'll have to try to come back to that. Unfortunately, Stephen cannot hear us, but we can hear him. I don't know if anyone can get that message to him, um, but let me continue to move along here. And we will try to get Stephen to join us a little later. Okay, moving on with our agenda, item number three, approval of our May minutes. Council members have received the minutes of our May 26 meeting. And at this time, I would like to ask for a motion to accept the minutes of the May meeting. So moved, this is Meredith Graham. Thank you, Meredith. Is there a second? Greg Goldman. Thank you, Greg. And is there anyone opposed? Okay, hearing none, our minutes are approved. Thank you very much. Um, item number four, our council report. I'm actually going to defer and cover that under our council business and work groups, because I think I would be repeating a lot of the stuff that we are doing. So I'll hold off until then. And at this point, I would like to turn things over to Secretary Dunn for her comments and thank her for joining us today and belated happy birthday wishes. We understand you had a birthday last week, so hope it was a great one. And thank you so much for joining us this morning. 
Thanks, Geraldine. You're rubbing it in because I think your your number. In fact, I know your number is smaller than mine. So, yes, I did have a good birthday. Thank you so much. And uh, when I came back in here, there were all kinds of goodies and uh, treats to celebrate. Really appreciate it. Um, again, I just want to echo your thanks to uh, Council and um, you know for your good work and and really uh, staying on point through the COVID pandemic. Staying focused and uh, for creating opportunities um, for input for the department because our business didn't slow down during the pandemic. Um, in fact, most of our workforce was doing what they always do out in the front line in parks and forests. And our teleworkers um, were working hard. Uh, in fact, we reported that uh, more productivity in, in many of our units due to the ability to focus and do their work from home. We're now at a uh, mode where those in the Rachel Carson are uh, coming in five out of 10 days. Again, it uh, works to get us together face to face and also it works to uh, you know, not have a full complement of people in the Rachel Carson uh, building with its, uh, you know, with its spaces and elevators and such, but it's, it's good uh, for us to see each other. And I really do look forward to uh, our face to face meetings with uh, council again and uh, again, thanks to uh, to our staff and, and others for making this meeting work. I know that the, the frustration with the technology is something we are uh, we're all dealing with here, but um, and look forward to hearing what the public comment is, hopefully at the end or hopefully in some other uh, in, in some other manner. Just a little bit about the summer season. It's, uh, you know, the. The core summer season in our state parks is about two thirds done. The two of the three big holiday weekends are behind us. Uh, visitation is very high. Uh, we've had capacity closures, meaning you know parks fill up and the gates have to close at the uh, typical Eastern PA parks. Um, high visitation across the system and uh, and forestry high camping numbers. Again, outdoor rec remains. Um, you know, big in people's lives. Um, our visitation is is tracking higher than the normal year, not quite as high as some of the weeks over the uh, season last uh, last year, but uh, very very high. Our staff are um, are, are busy. We, we've got a lot going on. We're hosting two major national conferences: the Association of State Park Directors. Uh, all the state park directors from across the nation will be coming in to Western PA in uh, in September. And the uh, foresters from across the United States will be coming into Pennsylvania and the Pittsburgh area. Also in September, our state liaison officers from across the country are coming into Pennsylvania uh, later that month. So we we're um, in the spotlight um, this fall, and it's all happening in September and October due to um, delay from you know last year's uh, you know travel restrictions on on due to COVID. So. Um, staff are, are working very hard. We, we are seeing uh, staff stress and we're uh, as a leadership team. We're working on uh, that issue, trying to get, cover the public demands, cover our uh, institutional demands and uh, really keep, uh, you know, keep the productivity moving. On the budget front, um, as, as you know, I think since we, yeah, since we last talked, the budget has passed and, and, and I know, uh, I know Conrad members watch this pretty carefully. It's pretty much a cost to carry budget. Um, again, we're uh, carrying forward tremendous uh, park and forest infrastructure needs, and and the grants program also has seen no no let up in the demand. The uh, the grant applications that came in came in very high, and, and as always, um, you know the funding doesn't doesn't match the need. Um, as you know, and, and Eric uh, Nelson, our ledge director, will probably be covering. Uh, there's been discussions. Uh, Senate Bill 525, sponsored by Senator Gordner and Senator Mensch, is floating around, which would give a boost um, to environmental stewardship fund to help with uh, park and forest infrastructure and, and grants and land conservation, all these uh, all these areas. So that's that's floating around. It uh, it did not pass in time for this budget, of course, but. Is something we're certainly uh, excited by and keep keeping our eyes on. Uh, the budget did allow for us to hire 25 um, more rangers, and we're working on that. Uh, again, we're facing the same challenges that any anyone hiring people right now is facing. Um, 
there's a huge demand for for law enforcement right now and in the state pay scale isn't isn't uh, competitive with uh, townships and, and other places because we see our, our rangers as unique uh, sort of person who, who really is suited for understanding the natural world at parks interacting with the public uh, you know 99% of the time helping them with something and but the law enforcement part of that's very important it comes into play at times and sometimes pretty dramatically so we do need uh, we do need that looking at the uh, US, the, the federal rescue dollars uh, you know with Silas Chamberlain being on the, the call here and Silas being a Conrad member Silas had written a white paper that's very helpful in uh, guiding and educating um, folks on the potential uses of rescue dollars and the fact that uh, a legitimate use is uh, parks and forests and trails um, of those dollars. So if you haven't uh, read Silas's white paper, um, Gretchen or myself or Silas can uh, provide it. Last week we had uh, switching to a different subject. Last week we had a uh, a Supreme Court case um, came, uh, you know, came came out was decided. Uh, Supreme Court of Pennsylvania issued a four to three decision, and it was about the use of oil and gas lease fund dollars. And essentially, what it said, if you if you think about the uh, the 2012 case, uh, it talked about some of the oil and gas lease funds being part of the corpus of the trust. In the royalty dollars, the, the money that actually comes from gas leaving the public lands that was part of the public trust. This finding um, by the Supreme Court is, uh, is, says that the bonus rents fines all the funds coming from gas on the public lands belongs to the corpus of, of the trust and the, you know, the trust. And it also talks about um, that the trust, that this money needs to be used intergenerationally, it's long-term funding. In, in other words, used for um, the, uh, you know, the, the Article 1, Section 27 purposes of long-term uh, benefit to future generations. So that was um, that was last week. There's still a couple, uh, again, DCNR was not a party to these lawsuits. It's really the Commonwealth, um, Pennsylvania, uh, is, is the budgeting is done, uh, you know, at, at that level, but it affects DCNR. So we're watching this um, with with strong interest. A couple cases still out there with uh, PEDF. Um, it's the, the question of using uh, the the oil and gas lease fund for the management of the uh, public trust responsibilities DCNR holds, the management of the public lands, the, the full mission of the agency. Which is a long term sustainability mission and, and use of that for operating type expenses of uh, DCNR. So that's still, still out there. There's another one out there about the, um, uh, I think, I think council asked for the update on PDF. There's still the other one out there about the forest management plan of 2016. And that, uh, that's a DCNR case. And that's, uh, that contends that uh, the report, um, Consider the oil and gas and, and other uses uh, on, on, on equity with uh, with the forest uh, ecosystem side. Of course, we we don't agree with that, but that's uh, that's still out there. Um, on that on that front, of course, uh, I think people are looking at the uh, the generational forest management plan that we're launching and is underway right now. The forest strategic plan that's uh, that's underway now. Okay, switching to we've got a lot to cover today. Uh, Chris Nicholas from our Susquehanna District Forest will be covering the ATV pilot. We've got a lot of interest on this uh, ATV pilot. Uh, the opening day of the uh, the pilot was July of uh, 16th, so it's still pretty pretty new. 900 permits have been sold so far. That's a fairly high uh, level of interest. Just to review. Uh, where that's uh, coming from. If you remember, uh, the fiscal code of 18 required DCNR to create a um, connectors between uh, the Blaise Skillet and Whiskey Springs and into the community of Renovo. Again, it is part of the fiscal code. DCNR, as, as always, attempts to follow the law, and we uh, began work and assessment of a connector 
into Renovo from both of those sites. So the concept of connecting existing um, ATV trails and forest land. Um, and then um, and then this fiscal code that passed as part of the um, the 712 budget you know, that, that passed in November had a, uh, the pilot uh, issue in it and it had some timelines. We flipped on some of the timelines. It was a lot to get together in time for the um, ATV season. So it launched in July, not May. But uh, again, it's a true pilot. Um, many, many things are being monitored and assessed by both DCNR, the counties, the townships, the local folks, the users, the opponents, um, yeah, you name it. But on the DCNR side, you'll learn from Chris Nicholas about um, our approach to monitoring both um, you know, all the pillars of our monitoring work, sustainability, the environmental issues, social and economic issues. So we'll be monitoring all of that. Essentially, um, and if you really boil it down for us, um, it opens up 11 miles of uh, forest road, what was previously off limits to ATVs. As you know, our strategy on ATVs has been twofold. Number one, grants to uh, counties and authorities to create ATV parks like AOA8 has been highly successful. I see Pat Max on the uh, on the call, and also Rock Run in Cambria County. These are destination uh, ATV parks, and we use a grants program for that, along with DEP funding for abandoned mine land. These are always on the abandoned mine land areas. The uh, the other strategy is the ATV areas embedded in the forest are designed trails. And I'm uh, pleased to say, I don't think we've ever had a fatality on the ATV trail that are designed in, in the state forests, and that you know, safety is a big concern. The pilot's essentially more about transportation and you know, people want to travel, go from place to place, go into the communities. So it's really got, um, it really relates to township and PennDOT roads, and then DCNR, uh, DCNR roads to connect uh, in places to this. So it's designated uh, with a lot of work by our staff and, and locals as, as in PennDOT, a series of roads and routes that were deemed to be a good place to try the pilot. Of course, we'll be looking at safety, environmental impacts, social impacts, economic impacts as part of the monitoring. There's a lot of public interest in this. There's a couple webinars planned for public um, updates. One is on August 18th. All of our advisory committee members will be invited uh, to attend um, this webinar. That'll include Conrack, of course, our main advisory committee. There's another public webinar on August 25th. We'll put that on our DCNR ATV website, and that's you know uh, going to be available for uh, for the general public to uh, attend, uh, give input, uh, thoughts, etc. And again, uh, monitoring. Uh, we have a you know, a strong monitoring plan in place. I think Chris Nichols will probably be uh, covering that. Again, it's a pilot, so um, public engagement is critical. Um, that it would ask people to, um, you know, when people enter this issue with uh, start, starting opinions, uh, you're pretty strong on both sides, uh, but the purpose of the pilot is to look at actually what happens, what actually happens uh, when when this when this happens. So we, we hope that people will in addition to whatever perspective they, they currently hold, look at um, what the what happens in the pilot and look at the uh, monitoring and uh, results from that, uh, because that's the assessment that the, the legislature plans to do, and that's the assessment DCNR is certainly uh, planning to do. So I know there's a lot of interest in that. That's a big topic in today's meeting, so I'll, I'll move on. Something uh, we're keeping an eye on at the federal level, uh, CCC legislation. As you know, DCNR, a lot of our public lands, a lot of our amenities were built, were built by the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, we're, uh, you know, Senator Casey has introducing a Restore Environmental Vitality, Improve Volatile Economy uh, Act, <laughs> Revive. Um, and, and we're very interested in this and keeping an eye on it. Uh, we have the Pennsylvania Outdoor Corps right now as we speak, uh, crews are out across the state working in the public lands and working in uh, local local parks and trails. Um, we're set up uh, with our partnership with labor and industry with the 
great needs we have for work on trails, for work in uh, structures and facilities and uh, buildings, and including the old CCC buildings. Um, we're uh, keeping an eye on uh, the, the, the Casey uh, bill. Also with our uh, commitment to green infrastructure and to solar arrays and to uh, greening our state park system, uh, the, the GISA program we have, um, we feel we have a ready-made fit for this program. So we're uh, watching that uh, carefully and, and those who are involved in um, in the advocacy, I encourage you to uh, ask us uh, for how we see that being a good fit and perhaps um, help us out on that. Uh, speaking of the outdoor core, uh, every summer when the youth crew is on, again, reminding people we've got uh, adult and youth crews out there working across the state, um, our exec team is visiting crews. We try to get an exec team member or myself out to every crew to sit down and talk about careers and conservation. We've, we've used sustainability as both the land and the uh, public natural resource, as well as the uh, staff who uh, who carry it forward and the citizenry that carries it forward. So our outdoor core crews are designed to create you know conservation environmental citizens, but also workers, and give them the skills and interest in that. So uh, some of the crews I visited included the uh, we have a sign language crew out in the uh, Pittsburgh area. And again, this, this crew communicates uh, by sign language, very effective, very, um, very uh, interested in the work, uh, gave, gave great uh, interaction with our the first lady and myself when we visited them. We had great, great crews all over the state. Our staff are coming back in from the field uh, for these visits and talking about the uh, inspirational um, meetings they're having with our young people working out there and the crews in this very, very oh, hot yeah, summer. Um, this I came off a, uh, I was sharing my time this morning with a Chesapeake Bay meeting, our, our state uh, team. Like, so, so I can't the, get back and forth. That's the problem here. I can't. He's trying to get. Aira, Aira, I can hear you speak. I, I think maybe you're not on mute. Um, anyway, um, the, the Chesapeake Bay, uh, Pennsylvania WIP team is meeting today. Uh, of course, DCNR is interested in that. The commitment we've made is for riparian streamside buffers. And just as uh, with our our own park and forest infrastructure, just as with our, our grants program, we have a big mandate and uh, and not enough funding. So we're we're in search of a good funding stream for buffers. Uh, another, sorry, Gerald, I'll, I'll wrap it up here quickly. Um, the other thing we've been busy with, and I think I mentioned this at the last meeting because we had started a round of old growth forest um, network additions in Pennsylvania. Um, just by way of quick background, we have a lot of designated old growth forest in Pennsylvania and Penn's Woods, a lot of forests, uh, some, some of them are managed forests, but um, the old growth forest network uh, adds specific areas for the public to visit. Um, we're up to 18 and these are areas that are protected for old growth and are either currently old growth or have a goal of developing into old growth. They're partway on the way, but uh, yeah, need, need a couple more decades or, or more. Um, so we're up to 18, we added six new ones in the last couple months. Uh, our staff told the old growth network teams, uh, John, John Norbeck did in fact, uh, that we want to have one in every county. We see this as a good equity move because I think it's appropriate that uh, citizens of Pennsylvania, all 13 million could have access to what Pennsylvania looked like um, when it was completely forested by old growth. So we're setting a goal saying it publicly now <laughs> to be have to have 67 counties in the old growth forest network and we'll have to work with that organization to make that happen that's you know they really control that but we we propose places but in our old growth program at dcnr uh we have 20,000 acres currently designated as old growth so i'll wrap up with that uh obviously there's more i could uh to talk to but um i've taken enough time thanks for uh thanks for putting me on the agenda Thank you, Cindy. Appreciate your comments and appreciate you joining us. Let me just open it up. Does anyone have any questions for the secretary at this time? Dave Trimpey. Hi, Cindy. Thanks for your Hi, Dave. Go right just ahead. Wondered if, 
wondering if you could just give her a brief uh, what's going on with the timber sale market. I understand it's picked up quite a bit. I'm just wondering where DC and R is with the putting up timber sales. Hey, Dave, I'm gonna. I asked uh, John Norback to sit in here in my office with me. He got he got kicked out of Webex, so I'm, I'm gonna turn to him momentarily, and uh, then I'll come right back. Uh, is it? Yeah, it, it, yeah. John uh, reports it's on the upswing. Uh, what uh, what are we seeing in terms of the the market? Is it? I know it, the thing we we're struggling with the uh, is market issues, uh, and there had been it had been the imp export issue but is it is it uh up across the spectrum or only certain types that's true yeah we're seeing as, as we know the uh cherry market had had suffered for a while dave um we'll send you a, an email with uh, the the latest um but anyways it is it is kicking back up it was most um most recently in front of John and me in terms of our predictions on the augmentations in our budget where we were able to predict it'll be up a bit. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Okay. Any other questions for the secretary? Um, Geraldine, this is uh, Rocco Ally. Um, this is not a question, but um, uh, Cindy, uh, uh, just so that you're kind of aware, the Fish Commission had a meeting Monday. Um, there's a proposed rulemaking that will um, put trout season the first Saturday of April. Um, perhaps it's proposed now, but I'm pretty sure it's going to become final um, for 2022. And I think that's important that you and your staff at our at the Cooperative Lakes know. Um, and if you if you think it's necessary, um, perhaps you could contact uh, Tim Schaefer and try to get uh, him on our agenda if if it meets with council approval to give an update on uh, how cooperative DCNR and the Fish Commission have been together. Uh, thanks, Rocco. Yeah, I would, I would. Yeah, we talk frequently to Tim. I mean, all, like weekly. And it's, I've never seen the collaboration between fish. And vote and the DCN be stronger, and um, you know for everything from the riparian forest buffers to uh, the recreational opportunities, fishing, the learn to fish programs. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, John's again. He's sitting here in the office. And he's nodding. He and Tim have been talking about the opener, so we were on board and uh, been very supportive. Um, it did remind me uh, you mentioned fish and boat. We we have a new governor sportsman advisor. Derek Everly started um, last week. Um, Derek uh, is on is on board, and of course, as as always, the, the uh, governor sportsman advisor is located in uh, in DCNR. So that's uh, that's a person maybe council would like to meet um, at um, at some point. Just, it, sorry, Darren, just back back a little bit. Um, on the timber thing that obviously housing starts are way the heck up as everyone knows so you drive around you see it you read about it so housing starts back up um is you know those prices of materials are, are dampening that a bit you know prices of uh timber everyone's complaining about that that that's high and there's a tariffs on the canadian timber okay yeah yeah that may keep the prices high you know so there's, there's those issues that are cross currents in the timber market Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the secretary? Okay, Cindy, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. Today is not a good WebEx day for us, that's for sure. I know we have a, another member, council member that's been trying to get on and it's just, he's just having difficulty. So we apologize for all of this. Some of this is just not, under our control to to uh, make better, unfortunately. So, but with that, the one good thing is that I was able to stomp on a number of spotted lantern flying nymphs this morning while out on my deck. <laughs> I got a, a good eight or ten of them, so they're coming in numbers. I have I'm surprised at how many I'm seeing. 
But uh, but anyway, with that, if we could move on to our DCNR department report, and I'm going to turn it back over to Gretchen Leslie. Gretchen. Thanks, Daryl, and uh, apologies, everybody, for the difficulties we're having today. You think after we've done this six or seven times, we'd uh, get the swing of things. So I will be happy when we are back in the Rachel Carson building. Um, you know, Era had to step away, so she turned over her controls to me, which is a dangerous thing. Um, so uh, that's why you heard us kind of kibitzing a little bit there about getting people in. So um, just really quickly before um, I do turn it over to uh, Chris Nicholas to, to talk about the ATV pilot, um, just a reminder that uh, we have two more uh, advisory Council meetings uh, in 2021. Uh, that they are September 22nd and November 17th. It is our intent to be back in the Rachel Carson building uh, with the September meeting. Uh, we are planning to offer a hybrid meeting where people can still call in. I'm thinking we're going to ditch WebEx uh, and go to Microsoft Teams if we can. Uh, so I think that uh, that will be a little bit more um, of, a, of an easier meeting to conduct uh, as we welcome people back in person. Uh, so stay tuned for details on that, but fingers crossed that's how we'll be. Uh, I just want us, uh, I did, was going to um, uh, announce Derek Eberly as the director of the governor's advisory council to hunting, fishing and conservation, but Cindy already took care of that. Uh, uh, Derek did, did replace Rob Miller, uh, who recently retired and Derek uh, formerly worked for the uh, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership um, as its first Pennsylvania field representative. And he's also the owner and head guide of Keystone Fly Guide. So we'll hope to have him uh, meet you all council members uh, here in the near future, uh, because obviously there's intersection of his work and, and our work for the agency. Um, so uh, I'm, uh, one more item I just thought I would mention, because I, I found this bit of news uh, recently about our Keystone Tree Fund. You have heard me mention uh, this before, which is a check off, a $3 check off on your vehicle registration. Um, and we're very, very pleased to how that fund is going. As of June 30th, uh, we have collected um, about $184,000, uh, which will be support, uh, used to support grants uh, for tree planting and, and tree buffers. So that's, that's, that's a great number and a great um, uh, revenue stream for a tree planting. Uh, those revenues come from more, more than 70,000 individual $3 donations. So, um, so when you're filling out your registration, you might want to consider checking that box. Uh, so just a little plug for the Keystone Tree Fund and the good work that that is doing for tree planting in Pennsylvania. Uh, so with that, I am hoping, with my fingers crossed, since Era is not here, that Chris Nicholas can unmute himself uh, and give us a little update as to what he has seen in the ATV pilot area. Chris, are you able to join us? I tried to unmute myself. Can everybody hear me? Yes, I can. Excellent. Yes. See you too. Thank you. Yes, I can as well. So. Okay, so I'm uh, Chris Nicholas. I'm the forest district manager here in the Susquehannock Forest District up here in Potter County. Um, we have Potter and McKean, uh, most of McKean, some of McKean goes to the Elk State Forest. But I thought what I'd do is just start with a little background about our area and uh, ATV riding has been here for decades. We have an ATV trail here that starts at our office in Denton Hill. And it's, I think it was opened in the, like 1986. So we have a long history with uh, ATVs here. And um, some of the county roads, the township roads have been open to ATVs for 20 plus years. Um, so we have a lot of dirt township roads, especially um, north of Route 6 and actually south of Route 6 intermingled with the state forest land also. So there's um, the backbone for some of a, an expanded trail system um, to access larger um, destination type riding is available here where it might not be in some other places. Um, we're just unique in that, um, you know, the, the, the roads and trails that are here 
almost connect already and there was very minimal amounts of connectivity that were needed to to make uh, the connections that um, we identified as being uh, important or potential. Um, there was a lot of pre-planning went into um, what we came up with. Um, you know, we looked at a couple of priorities. We had basically three main priorities was uh, connecting our trail system here. We have 45 miles right here that's open to anybody that has a registration and insurance and a helmet can come and ride here. Um, connecting that to other legal riding opportunities, which primarily were township roads that are already open. Uh, the second priority was connecting to local communities and businesses. And the third priority we looked at was connecting to uh, some of our other ATV trails. And in this case, that would um, be two other ATV trails, the one in the Ty Dotton and Haneyville and the one uh, Whiskey Springs north of Renova. Um, right now with the township road system, you can get to Tamarack, so you're relatively close um, to that one. And you can get up onto Pine Mountain in the northern part of Black Forest on a township road. Um, so those are the two ATV trails we looked at. Um, so we identified a route that would essentially connect our ATV trail to open township roads with um, some short connectors would with PennDOT would connect us to other township roads and would allow access to several um, communities and a lot of businesses uh, adjacent to our trail system. When I say adjacent, you know, I mean, I'm, I guess uh, within 10, 15 miles of our trail system. So you can essentially with these, with the pilot, you can get to Cowdersport, you can get to Sweden Valley, you can get to Germania, Cross Fork, uh, Watrous. Um, we thought we were going to get into Galton, but um, we didn't get the uh, the town. There's one township there that opted to not uh, be involved. So, um, but there's a lot of um, opportunities uh, that present itself here to get to those places. So with approximately, uh, I think it's 12, 12 and a half miles of state forest roads and snowmobile trail and another 12 miles of PennDOT road segments, we were able to make all that connectivity happen the whole way from Colton Point State Park to Cowdersport. So I, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but the primary um, pilot, the route the, that we um, identified is around a little over 120 miles. And then there's other township roads that are open that connect into it. So the total riding opportunities, um, including our trail system in the pilot is over 250 miles. So um, pre-opening that though, um, Cindy talked about monitoring. So several things that are in the works there is we set up some trail counters um, along some of the roads, along some of the uh, non-motorized trails that are adjacent to the area. Um, we also identified invasive plants uh, along the route on state forest land. Um, so a lot of these township roads actually uh, south of Route 6 go through state forest land. So if it was a township road that went through state forest, we did a uh, inventory of a invasive plants along the route. We also identified um, any road trails that already existed where there was illegal riding happening. Um, what we found was there were virtually none of those, but what we did find was a lot of places where potentially people could go. So we identified those and we're going to monitor those periodically and see if there's any with uh, the opening of the, the route, if there's any additional use of those potential um, illegal trails. I'm trying to think. Um, we're working with um, Penn State, uh, the Recreation Department. They're going to be doing some um, talking to users and people that live or have camps along the route and getting us kind of doing some social monitoring. 
We're also working with Mike Jacobson at Penn State. He's going to be doing some uh, forced economics, um, some economic monitoring. He's actually going to look at um, getting with some of the businesses in the area, either on the route or off the route, see if their business has impacted positively or negatively. Um, you know, obviously the people that you can connect to on the route, the thought is they're going to get a positive impact, but does the um, other user groups because of the ATV ridings here is it affecting other businesses? So we're trying to look at the whole uh, package of everything. Um, they're they're going to um, do that in the next, I guess, till 2022, and then part of the code that that was uh, that we're trying to follow, we have to give a report to the uh, legislator in uh, tw early 2023, I believe. So um, we did all that. We got a permit system up. The, um, you actually have to buy a tag to be legal on the PennDOT and State Forest connector roads. This was additional to the trail. So um, the township roads are open by designation. The State Forest Trail is open. So you don't need the tag to ride those, but if you want to ride the connectors between the roads and make all these connections of the pilot route, you need to have the the permit tag. The cost of that this year, because we started it halfway through the season, we prorated it to twenty dollars. Next year it'll be forty. Um, next year we're looking at uh, potentially getting to the Haneyville Trail if we can get the. Um, trails to get there upgraded and and have a sustainable route um so that would allow you to ride that next year um and then potentially if the pilot continues we're looking at whiskey springs a connection there um so those those tags would get you access from memorial day weekend through the end of september uh essentially that's our riding season we think that riding season at least from the district perspective here is uh, really important in that, you know, in the fall, uh, it ends right before hunting seasons start. So we don't have that conflict uh, of uh, somebody hunting and an ATV rider. We don't, we also on our ATV trail do most of our major maintenance in the month of October when there isn't machines on and before the, the soil gets too wet that we can't do anything in November. And then usually May is the other month we, things dry out sometime late April to the point where we can actually do maintenance. So we like the riding season for a variety of reasons, but primarily it's, uh, it allows other user groups some time where they don't have to, uh, have the impact of ATV riding and vice versa. So, um, that's a general overview, I guess, of, uh, what got us to where we are here in the district. So we, we opened on July 16th. Um, we, to this point, we've sold a little over 900 permit tags, which we anticipated a lot more than that. Um, but I'm not sure if I think the word got out. I'm not sure why we didn't sell more. Um, I thought we'd sell a lot more than that, but it's been pretty much a non event up here. We have, uh, people riding, but it's not overwhelming. Um, it's actually maybe less than we normally would have and i think that's because we spread them out over a larger area so we don't see as many of them and we're primarily focused on obviously on state forest land so the most of the additional riding opportunities are actually on township and uh roads and such so we don't you know we're maybe we're we're not seeing that activity there as much but i think it spread people out um we anticipate Labor Day weekend will be a big weekend that usually is anyway in the month of September because that's the last month of the riding season. But to this point, we haven't seen a ton of activity. We've only issued one citation since it started. And that person, I'm not sure, had any intentions of ever riding a pilot route. He was a local fellow that was on a township road that happened to go through state forest land and he didn't have any registration or insurance or anything. So um, he wouldn't have been caught though. Because without us working a little extra patrol hours for the pilot. So as far as the people on the pilot route that we've been in contact with, everybody's had 
their permits and has been uh, being respectful and behaving and uh, we haven't had any any major issues there. Um, I think that's about all I was going to cover. I know I only had 10 minutes and I probably pushed that. Well, thank you, Chris. And let me just open it up to any questions from our council members for Chris or Gretchen after her presentation as well. Uh, Gretchen, this is Rocco Ally. Chris, um, I'd like to compliment you on the work you've done. I think this is a great step forward to giving more attention to the uh, motorized recreational needs that we have. Thank you. Chris, this is uh, this is Bob Kirshner. Uh, I just had a quick question about the permit system. Uh, you referred to needing a permit for some of the connectors. Are those all state forest road connectors or does that also include some of the township connectors? I, I guess it does. Um, no, the township connectors are actually designated open, so you don't really need the the permit for that. What it gets you is access on state forest roads that are in the connector and also uh, state forest trails that are specifically um, designated as part of this connector and pilot program. It also gets you the PennDOT segments that are open, which will be more going forward if we uh, move, you know, to connect to the other trails. And we're working with the county and we, we're trying to, uh, you know, get the stakeholders together and work with them and get their input and, Get them to understand what our, you know, objectives are with uh, the pilot program and, and work with them. And I think we're doing a pretty good job of that too. Um, have a pretty good relationship with everybody locally here. Well, th thank you for that answer. And I uh, echo Rocco's sentiment. Uh, great job and, and glad to see it and good luck. Well, not everybody's happy about it. I will say that we've taken. Uh, several complaints from local residents and uh, people along the pilot route, but all in all, um, I think it's it's more positive than negative from the local perspective here. Thank you. Any other questions for Chris or Gretchen? Okay, thank you so much, Chris, for joining us today. We appreciate your time. Yep, no problem. Thank Have you. Have a good day. Yep, you too. I'm going to uh, sign off here, but if anybody wants to get a hold of me, um, my email is just cnicholas at pa.gov or give us a call here at the district office. Be glad to explain more or discuss anything you want to talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Take care. Okay, next on our agenda is our legislative report from Eric Nelson, director of legislative affairs. Hi, Eric. How are you? Hey, good. How are you? Can everybody hear me? Good. Everybody hears. Okay. I think so. All right. I just wanted to, I'll give a quick update um, on a few. We have a, a slew of uh, upcoming events um, that we're participating in around the state. I'll just run through those real quick. Um, just say that on August 2nd, uh, we are going to be participating in a tour with the House Democratic Policy Committee at Presque Isle. Uh, Secretary Dunn and Deputy Secretary John Norbeck will be in attendance for that event. That's on August 2nd. Um, on August 10th, uh, we are participating in a Senate Policy Committee roundtable discussion in Schuylkill County. Uh, Tom Ford, uh, we'll be in attendance uh, talking about uh, pollution and funding opportunities in uh, the Schuylkill River um, for cleanup purposes. So that's on August 10th. Um, we're also participating in an elk, elk tour um, on September 16th with the Game Commission, uh, the Game and Fish Committee, and the House Tourism Committee. Uh, we're doing that on September 16th. In Elk County, that's the Elk Tour. I'm sure everybody's familiar with. And then the next day, we're actually doing a tour of Kinzu State Park. Uh, so that's um, with both Game and Fish and the House Tourism Committees. That's September 16th and September 17th. 
and we're currently working on gathering uh, information for a tour of Ohio Pile for the, both of those committees as well, and the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon for the Senate Environmental Resources Committee. Um, I think details are still being ironed out for those events. So those are just a few things happening. It's been busy. Um, and I'll just mention, as the secretary uh, noted earlier on the call, we are monitoring uh, Senate Bill 525, which we, which we support, and we're just um, we're trying to get everyone's attention for that for that bill. Um, it's very important to us. And also, I'll just mention that Senator Regan um, recently circulated a co-sponsorship memo um, regarding OHMs and uh, their use on state land. It would open up our state land for OHM purposes. Uh, we do have concerns with that with that bill. Uh, Representative Allett has a companion piece in the House, uh, which we have concerns about. So we'll just, um, we're gonna continue having discussions on on those two pieces of legislation. So that's, that's all I wanted to mention. Uh, Nate, do you have anything that you wanted to, to add? No, I think that pretty much covers it. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your report. Thank you. Okay, we will move along to our council business. Um, and basically council prepared and recently sent 2 letters. The 1st provided comments to the Pennsylvania State Board of Education on proposed changes to the academic standards for science and technology. CONRAC supports separate standards for science and technology and for environment and ecology. That was one letter that went out. Our second one was with regards to the American Rescue Plan funding. Um, CONRAC was urging Governor Wolf and the General Assembly to allocate American Rescue Fund funding for the infrastructure of state parks and state forests, which is in excess of $1 billion. As we all know, we've been working hard with our infrastructure concerns there. So both of these letters were finalized by email. Uh, they were not talked about at a public meeting just due to the time sensitivity and the public comment deadlines that were involved. So what we do need to do is ratify these letters. They were all approved via email and sent out and they are available on our CONRAC website if anyone would like to see them in further detail. But at this point, I would like to ask for a motion to ratify those two letters. If someone could do that for Cheryl, me. So moved, Rocco Allen. Thank you. Thank you, Rocco. Is there a second to that? Greg Goldman. Thank you, Greg. And is there any opposition? Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you. And like I said, both of those letters did go out recently uh, and are available on our, our website if anyone is interested in seeing them firsthand. All right, now we're moving on to our large scale solar siting in Pennsylvania. Today we have with us um, Robert Young from DEP, and he is gonna, he's with the Energy Programs Office. Uh, and also we'll be hearing from Nicole Faraguna, DCNR's Director of Policy. But for starters, I'd like to turn it over to Robert. Robert? All right, thank you very much. Just want to thank uh, the council for um, inviting me to talk about this topic and Nicole and her team for helping um, prep me to, to speak. Um, I'll just jump right in, move, if we can move to the next slide. Um, kind of what I want to leave you with today, just, just a couple high level topics. I just kind of want to provide a baseline um, and kind of shared understanding of kind of grid scale, or you might hear it called utility scale. Those terms are used interchangeably, but just um, kind of define the scope of these projects, uh, discuss some of the factors driving this development within the Commonwealth, uh, briefly explain how these projects are proposed and developed, um, show some maps with some kind of high level, um, just showing where a lot of these projects are being proposed, and then um, kind of go into some of the 
the issues that are being identified in some of the resources, uh, DEP and some of the other state agencies are starting to develop to address this. This is definitely a quickly moving topic. Uh, feels like new new issues are being identified almost on a daily basis. So it's definitely something that's got a lot of attention and um, we definitely want to coordinate efforts moving forward uh, with different state agencies and different stakeholders. So if we can move to the next slide. Just some background um, on where I'm coming on the next slide, please. Just just um, you know, as I was talked about in the introduction, I'm coming from the DEP Energy Programs Office. It's, it is a non-regulatory aspect of DEP uh, responsible for implementing clean energy programs, um, definitely with a focus around renewable energy and climate mitigation, climate change mitigation and adaptation. Um, there's obviously regulatory parts of DEP that we interface with, but I'm kind of talking more from the, this perspective today, but I can definitely uh, channel questions to the regulatory side if any of those arise. Uh, next slide. So just kind of starting off, uh, in 2018, uh, there was a solar future plan kind of commissioned by the state through our office that brought together a lot of stakeholders to, to kind of set a, a goal for solar adaptation across the state. Again, this is more of a, a policy, a goal document, not necessarily a mandate. Uh, but the consensus coming out of that plan was, you know, over the next 10 years, um, I guess nine years now, by 2030, getting to about 10% of electricity use and consumption coming from uh, solar sources. Um, on the high end of that mix, um, the one extreme is, you know, a planning uh, assumption of 90% of that would come from grid scale or utility scale sources, which would be about 10 gigawatts of solar generation. Um, and at a kind of a ratio of about one acre, I'm sorry, about eight acres of land needed for every megawatt of, of uh, grid scale solar construction, that'd be about 80,000 acres. Again, this is a three year old plan. Some of those assumptions have changed. I'll, I'll go into that a little more in some further slides. But that 90 kind of 10% mix, uh, the other 10% would be, you know, what they call distributed solar, you know, traditional you see on rooftops or um, alongside uh, structures, um, that that's kind of again that was for planning purposes. It, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out as different projects are being proposed. But some of the assumptions we're using is more of that 90-10 mix for what I'm going to present. Uh, next slide, please. So again, just to kind of baseline everyone, just so we have a shared understanding. Obviously, you know, there's a continuum of solar development, as I kind of mentioned. You move from the left with the, the residential and commercial, that's kind of a mature market. I think a lot of people are familiar with that. You know, over the past 10 to 15 years, uh, seen you know, a fair amount of, of construction, installation of these types of installations, lots of installers, a lot of communities are feel, familiar with this type of development. Obviously on the other end of the spectrum, grid scale, um, you know, these are kind of define it. These are the large facilities for the sole purpose of generating electricity to be sold into the grid and to be used off-site. Um, you know, for the most part, they're always going to be ground mounted. They require a significant amount of acreage to reach the economies of scale to make these projects attractive to developers. We'll talk about them in terms of megawatts. As I said, there's an, this is kind of an emerging market. Emerging market. Um, there's not a lot of guidance out there. It's something we're, we're examining and trying to provide that as a resource. In the middle there, you'll notice that concept of community solar. Um, that is something more along the lines of large rooftop mounted or installations that you know would take up you know you know two to ten acres or so. Um, it's 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 something that's allowed in a lot of states. It's not necessarily it's not actually allowed in Pennsylvania right now. That would require uh, legislative change due to some intricacies with the way public utility commission laws are. Um, but just like kind of bringing that up in here, just to kind of show that, you know, there's, there is another aspect of solar that, you know, because it's not uh, something that's necessarily allowed in Pennsylvania right now, that might change over the next couple of years. There are a couple of bills um, looking to change those PUC laws to a lot of those type of developments. So something to keep an eye on moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, you know, a lot of times we'll get these questions. Why is this type of development happening in Pennsylvania? You know, we're so far north, it's cloudy, 
this and that. Um, you know, there, there, there are a lot of reasons we're seeing it and we're seeing it now. Um, some of the big reasons kind of going clockwise from the left, you know, the, the access to the transmission infrastructure is a big deal um, because these um, projects, you have the express goal of selling electricity into the grid for use offsite. Uh, having having transmission a robust transmission infrastructure is attractive to developers. Pennsylvania is a net energy exporting state using traditional resources. So you know if you look at maps of where transmission lines are, they do crisscross the state uh, fairly well. In terms of the technical advances, um, you know these projects weren't being proposed if they weren't economically feasible. They're, the technology has moved to a point now where at our latitude and with our sun coverage, you know, these panels will generate enough electricity over the their lifetime to justify the cost. So that's not really a barrier like it was in the past. Um, there is availability of open land, perhaps marginal farmland that is attractive to developers. We'll kind of get into that as we're talking about land use concerns, which I know is of interest to this uh, council. And then from the policy and regulatory requirements, you know, I already acknowledged the Solar Future Plan, which is kind of a policy document. There was the governor's executive order to reduce carbon emissions in the state um, by, you know, by 26% um, by 2025 and 80% by 2050. Um, you know, again, those are goals. The only really regulatory requirement that ties up with this is what we hear called the Alternative Energy Portfolio Standard. In other states, they call them Renewable Energy Credits. But that is the concept where um, the electric trans, uh, the distribution companies, you know, your PPLs, your PICOs, um, you know, they have to have a, a certain percentage of their uh, of their electricity they sell come from alternative energy um, sources. And right now, the carve out for that is only 0.5 percent solar. That's that is um, kind of reached its max in 2021. That's really the only regulatory requirement present right now driving solar. Although there are bills looking to increase those percentages. Um, moving to the next slide, you kind of moving into the development characteristics with these types of projects. It's really being driven by the relationships between the developers working with the landowners. Um, developers will look for sites that are favorable, engage with the landowners, initially um, lock up into a lease option. Um, if they get the, the permitting and other uh, requirements move forward with the project, that would obviously move forward into a land lease. I'll go into a little bit more detail on that on the next slide. Um, you know, looking at some other characteristics of these types of projects, they will not, they do not require the additional subdivision of property of large tracts of land like some other construction projects. In terms of state oversight, as I mentioned before, kind of coming from the, the non-regulatory side of DEP, but from the regulatory side, um, there's not really a special carve out for these types of projects like you might find with other power generation facilities, whether they be coal fired or gas fired. Really, they're treated like other construction projects with the standard water and erosion permitting related you know, to anything that disturbs more than an acre. But there's no special solar permit. There's no special um, process they really go through from DEP's perspective. You know, they would be treated just like a warehouse or a shopping center or any sort of other sort of you know, residential or commercial development. Um, in terms of other characteristics of the projects that you, know, you might hear is, you know, they may present opportunities to preserve farmland for future agricultural use if the project is properly decommissioned and um, if that land is not being productive and it's staying contiguous and under one owner. And if in during the use of the projects while they're in production of electricity, you know, there are opportunities for integration into agricultural uses, whether that be grazing to maintain the undergrowth or the planting of pollinators to improve the agricultural health of adjoining properties. So moving to the next slide. You know what what we hear a lot are why why are developers looking for a specific site so you know the ideal site for a from the developer's perspective and you've kind of heard me kind of preview this in some of the previous slides are that they'd be contiguous parcels cleared land is very important to them limited slopes obviously is very important and that proximity to existing transmission infrastructure um this, these combination of of factors is what drives what the lease rates that are often landowners are. There's kind of no standard lease rate we're finding. They could range anywhere from, you know, 200 to $500 to as high as, you know, 1500 to $2,000 per acre per year once the 
um, project is constructed and operating. And unlike oil and gas, it's not tied to production, it's tied to the land use. So that would be a fixed amount that the landowner could plan on over the life of the project, which is typically you know, 25 to 30 years. Um, you know, th there is, I think a little bit more, we're hearing a lot of, as these projects are becoming more and more real, concern about the use of prime farmland for these hosting these projects. It's not necessarily the developers are seeking out uh, active farmland. It's just that that's already cleared land that's contiguous with limited slopes. And if they're near transmission infrastructure, there's going to be interest in them by the developers. And as I mentioned, you know, some of those lease rates, especially on the higher end, may exceed both the long and short term um, value from agricultural um, production. So again, as I mentioned, as these are relationships between the landowners and the developers, a lot of times the landowners are acting in their economic interests. Moving to the next slide. You know, this is just to kind of give a high level um, perspective of how these projects are, you know, kind of proposed and eventually get built. The organization that manages the data that I'm going to use on the next couple of slides is PJM Interconnect. And PJM is the organization that manages the operations of the grid in Pennsylvania to as far south as North Carolina to as far west as Indiana and Illinois. So they are tracking. So basically, um, developers are seeking permission to sell electricity into the grid at a specific point, and they submit the technical documentation to PJM to review that request and see if it's technically feasible and what kind of upgrades would need to be made to the transmission grid. From PJM's perspective, they're not really looking at land use or local zoning ordinances or things like that. They're purely looking at it from the impacts to the, the transmission grid. Um, but it is the most comprehensive data source. So I just kind of, you want to preview that. That's where these numbers are coming. A lot of times they don't have, you know, they're not, they're not factoring those things into the larger decision. So, you know, right now there's, this is always kind of changing. This is a snapshot from earlier this month. You know, there's about 180 projects that are kind of an initial review, but another 130 or so that have kind of met the first threshold and are continuing to be reviewed. And obviously that's that's the most of the projects that are being considered, being considered right now. But there's over there's 77 projects that have kind of overcome that threshold by PJM that have been approved to sell electricity into the grid at a certain point. Um, 62 of those are actively being considered, 15 are suspended. And what suspended means is you know, they've been approved to sell electricity in the grid and they might be running into some roadblocks getting local approval. I might be familiar with some of the projects in Adams County and other parts of the south central part of the state, which, you know, you know, the developer wants to move forward, but they're not getting the, the local approval to get the construction permits. So they still have the ability to sell electricity into the grid, but they aren't getting the local approval. And you, looking at this continuum, too, is, you know, if the projects in this, what they call the new services queue, there's most likely a, a, a high level agreement between a landowner and the developer for that project to move forward. What we're hoping, um, but we're not necessarily finding moving into that yellow phase, you know, the developers really should be starting to initiate conversations with local governments to get a better understanding of the requirements to get construction permits or, or if they don't need permits, just having those conversations with neighbors and looking at ordinances and things like that. We're finding there's some developers doing a very good job with that initial outreach, others that are not. And actually, as they're moving into that first green phase, obviously, you know, if they want to start construction, those, those, those conversations definitely need to have, have, but as I said, you know, there's some, there's some projects that, you know, cross that threshold from yellow into green, and that's the first time a municipality or a county might hear the project. So it's very, um, it's very different across the different developers and what their priorities are and their, their business models. So it's kind of all over the place. Um, there's, again, there's not, since this is more, tracking from the organization that manages the grid perspective it's it, it, it's because there's kind of a disconnect with some of the, the the information needed for local municipalities and you know we're hoping to streamline that a little better and make the local governments a little bit more aware of these projects um obviously not all these projects would ever be built a lot of them will fall out during the the review phase but what we're finding is more and more projects will will be re-entered in the queue to replace these i'm uh, moving to the next slide just kind of want to show, you know, we have moved from a, you know, <laughs> up till two or three years ago, the idea was, you know, how, how, why would 
you know, these this types of development happen within the Commonwealth. Um, you know, what what steps are needed to attract this development? Now, obviously, you can see with the rapid growth of the number of project proposals. You know, we've moved into you know, how do we manage this growth? How do we you know drive these projects or nudge these projects towards areas with the highest and best use of land? Because a lot of those considerations weren't even thought of three years ago as as the solar future plan was being developed. Um, next slide. So next next three slides um, again. This is all based on that data from from PJM. You know, there's about nearly 400 projects. You can see that it's pretty even distribution of projects across the entire Commonwealth. Higher concentrations in the South Central kind of a you know center and Clearfield counties. There have a lot of proposed projects, also as well as the northwest part of the state. Northwest was kind of at, odd when we first saw this, but talking to developers, you know, lots of transmission infrastructure that lands a little flatter than other parts of the Commonwealth and um, maybe you know, lower productive farms, which might make the lease rates um, you know, more desirable in the eyes of the developers. If you notice, notice in Clinton County, I kind of called out one project there. Um, as I mentioned, the, the PJM, new service queues kind of dynamic projects get added and subtracted all the time. There was a project in Clinton County that's gotten a lot of press that, not, that wasn't in the most recent, it was, has a status of withdrawn in the most recent snapshot I did of the PJM new services queue. But we know there's been discussions with the county and different permits being sought. Um, so I just kind of want to note that project that sometimes it doesn't make the maps, but it's, it's definitely something that's out there. Uh, moving to the next slide. This is just that same data, but as opposed to um, being expressed in absolute projects, this is just talking about it in terms of the megawatts of capacity for the different projects. You know, obviously it tracks pretty well. Um, again, there's that project, 250 megawatt project in Clinton County, just wanted to note a little separate. Um, but one of the key takeaway we like to share with this slide is, you know, cumulatively these projects add up to be on the scale of traditional power plants. Um, you know, a lot of folks are familiar with the Three Mile Island reactor that just came offline, which was rated at 819 megawatts. Um, a new gas power plant that recently opened in Cambria County was a little over 1,000 megawatts. Obviously, those, those can operate 24 hours a day, where the effective use of a solar installation is closer to 20, 25, 20 to 25% of the time. But again, these are on scale of, of you know, traditional power generation facilities, you see that total of uh, that cumulative total of 13.1 gigawatts that actually exceeds the 10 gigawatts or so um, that was outlined in the solar future plan for 10% by 2030. Um, projects, most of most of the projects are gonna be less than 25 megawatts, but there are a couple um, in that either active or in that suspended phase, there's an 80 megawatt project in York County, um, a 100 megawatt project in Adams County that, that's been recently suspended. The overall largest project is a 400 megawatt project in Lawrence County. Um, that's extremely large. And as I'm seeing articles of other proposals across the country, and they're talking about you know, large installations in the California, Arizona deserts, that's on scale with that. So it would be interesting to see if that project ever comes to fruition. Um, moving to the next slide. And again, this is. So I mentioned before at the time of the PA Solar Future Plan being um, written in 2018, the rule of thumb was about um, eight acres needed for every megawatt installed. The, the rule of thumb, developers will say that's closer to four to five now. We're probably using more like six acres per megawatt. Um, moving forward, it's more of a realistic expectation and looking at some of the data from the projects that have been built. Um, over the past uh, year or two in uh, primarily in Franklin County. So this is just that map, that last map of megawatts, just, you know, take everything times six to express it in terms of acres, which might be a little bit easier to wrap your minds around as opposed to megawatts, <laughs> which is kind of, you know, obviously electrical engineering concept that not everyone's familiar with. Um, so I'll leave this up for a second to let everyone digest this. Um, but uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, recently, we did, this is a very, very high level analysis. As I mentioned before, we're relying on the documentation from PJM. As I mentioned, they're, they're really only interested into the impacts on the grid. So a lot of times location data isn't necessarily available um, unless you have a lot of technical documents, but of the 
of the four, nearly 400 projects, there's a little over 200 where if you read through the documentation, you can kind of identify, at least in a general vicinity, of where the project is being proposed. Um, we did this a lot for outreach purposes to kind of narrow it down to a specific township or county to be able to engage with some of the stakeholders. But another beneficial use of this data was, you know, at, like I said, at a high level to get an understanding of, you know, what's the land use where these projects are being proposed. And as you can see, you know, over 80% of them would be from a lay person like me considering a farmland. And I don't know the, the soil type or the, the present use of, of the land, but looking at it from satellite photography, you know, it's open land, it looks to be cleared. Um, only 10 or so of the projects, you know, a little less than 5% of those ones identified, you know, clearly in a forested area. Um, there's about 33 and about 15% or so that might show some beneficial use on reclaimed lands, whether that be former mine lands, co-located on an existing power plant, whether it be on an ash basin or on some other land at the power plant, um, found one that looks like to be on a well field, one that actually might be on a roof. So this is relatively new. We're trying to get a better grasp on, on kind of the land use impacts and where these projects are being proposed. Um, but, this is definitely something for further conversation. None, none of this information, to be clear, has necessarily been verified uh, with the developers or, or the municipalities or, or landowners. Uh, moving to the next slide. I won't spend a lot of time a lot of, on this, but just to kind of show, you know, where, what is this land use in comparison to some other, other types of land use? So that 80,000 acres, that kind of yellow, yellow circle, these are all proportional and scaled. Um, but compared to farmland, whether it's uh, preserved farmland or farmland clean and green or forest, um, state parks and national forests. Sorry, I don't have, I didn't include the data for state forests in here, but you know, we talk about abandoned or former mine lands as an option, landfills, things like that. So just, just trying to get a perspective on you know, how this, this fits into the larger land use conversations across the Commonwealth. Um, moving to the next slide. Just quickly on economic development, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just to show, you know, just the scale of these projects, you know, according to the Department of Energy, it's a little over a million dollars per megawatt to develop one of these grid scale projects. And they broke down, they did analysis on what that money is being spent on. Um, you can kind of see at the top, 7% you know, of the projects are for land acquisition and, and taxes. And we can look at that as direct local investment, either to the property owner or the municipality. 9% is the installation labor, which, you know, through workforce development, which part of our office oversees for clean energy projects, you know, keeping that, at least within Pennsylvania firms, is an opportunity for economic growth within the Commonwealth. Um, some of the other costs associated with this, especially, you know, the panels, things like that, might not be captured within the Commonwealth. It's, you know, there are opportunities for local manufacturers to do things like structural equipment, or if the developers themselves are, are based in Pennsylvania, there's some opportunity for economic gain. But, you know, a typical 20 megawatt project, you know, it's about $22.6 million for the total project costs with, you know, a million and a half or up to three millions being captured locally. And then, you know, if all these projects were built out, we're talking about, you know, tens of billions of dollars of investment with um, billions, of, you know, 1.1 billions of dollars of local investment. So just just kind of want to look at that from high a higher level perspective. Next slide, please. You know, kind of wrapping up here, as I mentioned, this is a new topic and there's there's definitely a lot of what, you know, what we don't know we don't know or things that definitely need additional research and attention paid to them. Obviously, you know, as I mentioned before, guiding these developments to where they make the most sense and definitely including conversations about farmland, forest preservation, um, you're working with staff from DCNR as well as the Department of Agriculture on an interagency working group to kind of come up with best practices, um, you know, involving other parts of DEP for former mine lands and other brownfields, hopefully guide development to, to parcels where there might be a higher and better use for it. Um, there's also questions about property tax collections. This is a new use in Pennsylvania and trying to get a better grasp on, you know, those figures I just presented, how, how real those assumptions are. Often a lot of uh, pushback from neighboring residents, you know, property value impacts analysis needs to be done on that. It's how they impact neighboring properties. And a really big one is the end of project concerns, um, decommissioning, 
recycling disposal of the projects, restoration of the land. Um, right now, the best practice appears to be, you know, that decommissioning plan needs to be part of the lease agreement between the landowner and the developer, um, but giving make sure that there's resources for landowners so they know they need to include that through legal counsel, whether there's opportunities for local governments to ensure that um, before issuing construction permits for those projects, but that, that is a huge, um, huge, I won't call it an issue right now, but it's something that needs to be kept at the forefront of these conversations uh, moving forward to prevent um, any issues. Probably would never see a developer walk away from an active project because the costs would be all up front in building it and then they almost generate electricity for minimal costs because there's no fuel costs. But you know, at the end of the project life, definitely need the protection measures in place for the landowners and communities. Um, moving to the, the final slide, you know, as you know, from our office's perspective, moving forward, there is a lot of um, outreach and research. Um, our our focus, which is kind of underserved, would be from local government officials, where these decisions are going to be made governing the the permitting and construction of these projects. So we are actively identifying areas where there are high concentration of projects and reaching out to officials, also trying to hold regular forums here towards municipal officials to, to talk about these issues. But to back that up, um, you know, working, we're actually working with Penn State Extension and some component parts of the university to um, build on some research. A uh, professor from Dickinson Law has been doing around ordinance development and best practices, and then doing some research, um, you know, making sure it's not coming from industry and not coming from special interest group, but well-verified fact-based research on the physical, the land use, the economic, the environmental impacts. And it's kind of a continuous effort that, you know, the, the research on ordinance development and other issues will feed um, the outreach moving forward. And then the questions from the outreach and, and the folks living this day to day will inform um, the research that needs to be done moving forward. Um, and that's kind of the end of my prepared remarks. I know Nicole was going to follow up um, with some from the DCNR perspective as well. Hi, good morning. Uh, Geraldine, did you want me to just uh, provide some remarks now? Yep. Or that would be great. Perfect. And we fear we just save our questions uh, for the end for both of you at that point. So, yes, go right ahead, Nicole. Thank you. That sounds great. So, uh, thanks, Robert, for that really great overview of what's happening here in Pennsylvania. Just wanted to provide a bit of a DCNR perspective. So, I just want to start out by saying, you know, as, as you many of you know, DCNR is actively working to address climate change, um, advancing the governor's climate fo focused executive order, Secretary Dunn's priorities through sustainable green, green infrastructure solutions. So um, many of you would recall the 2018 climate change adaptation and mitigation plan that we put out, which resulted in identifying 123 action steps that are related to the areas that support our core mission. So we're really taking this seriously. Um, we're actively working to reduce the department's overall carbon footprint. And we're doing this in, in a variety of different ways through energy efficiency, through clean energy technologies, um, through, through sequestration. Uh, we have our Bureau of Geological Survey that's doing a lot of research to understand how we can promote best practices for geological carbon sequestration. And of course, our forests um, are really key. So we manage our forests sustainably. We help private forest landowners um, opt optimize the forest benefits. And of course, this includes carbon sequestration. And in addition, we're trying to increase our forest canopy. We want um, to increase um, the amount of trees planted, um, urban tree plantings, so that we can help increase carbon sequestration. Um, so. You, um, you also are probably familiar with DCNR state, state forest resource management plan, which guides the department in best practices. Uh, and again, really trying to reinforce that forests provide society a valuable service in mitigating the impacts of climate. And DCNR's forest lands alone uh, sequester approximately five and a half million standard tons of carbon uh, each year. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're doing, um, a lot in terms of investments 
Uh, you may have heard DCNR is investing in solar projects on our lands. I just want to make sure that you understand that these this does not include commercial scale solar projects. Um, we do not uh, site uh, utility scale projects on our lands, nor do we have plans to. Our projects are really small scale um, to power on site park and forest operations. And I think our sustainability team um, who does an amazing job uh, has done presentations for Conrack. So we're looking at no to low impact. We're looking at primarily roof mounted installations when feasible or ground mounted on, on marginal lands. And certainly uh, we're, we're not de uh, deforesting our property uh, for the sake of, of, of solar. Um, I also want to make it very clear that we are very supportive of solar. Um, we, we, we do realize um, that there are so many pieces of the, um, of the toolbox in order to combat climate change. And so we just see this as with any type of development, siting considerations are key. And so how can we, you know, we have concerns that significant forest loss could occur in the process. And we just want to make sure that decision makers are making the best possible practices. Uh, are using the best possible practices. Uh, so, in light of the increased utility scale solar activity, we have been uh, establishing an internal work group just to understand the potential impacts, develop a plan and strategy for DCNR's role in providing good information, technical assistance, and coordination among agencies and partners. Uh, we are already providing service to private landowners just through our service foresters. We're getting questions. We want to make sure that we're providing them with good information. Um, we're implementing best practices on our own land, so how can we support those key stakeholders to do the same? Um, we're, we're talking, as I mentioned, we're talking to key st stakeholders, DEP, of course, um, and our, our sister agencies, uh, NGOs, um, academic, Penn State Cooperative Extension um, has been tremendous in putting out information um, and, and webinars uh, and, and providing uh, resources. Uh, and of course, talking to conservation, municipal and planning organizations, just to understand what they're experiencing and what resources are needed um, across the board. We're also trying to research how other states are managing the increase in solar development because we're not alone. Um, this is happening across the country. As, as I mentioned, we're working on best management practices um, that support sustainable siting and management. Uh, and we're hoping to work with our key partners to develop that consistent messaging, help navigate our stakeholders really through the complexities and nuances of energy development and natural resource management and finding that right balance. Um, also, our PA Natural Heritage Program um, is, is engaged because of the implications when conducting PNDI reviews for, permer for permits. Um, you may have also heard of PA Pulse. Um, this is uh, the governor's project to utilize light and solar energy. Um, this is being run through the Green Gov Initiative and the Green Gov Council, and the Department of General Services is running point on this. And this is um, the idea is to to uh, increase the the uh, the amount of electricity, clean energy that the state government is is purchasing, um, and there's. Uh, installing uh, installations across the state um, right now, totaling about 191 megawatts. So I do want to say that we appreciate and support the Green Gov Council's adoption of the Nature Conservancy's best practices. So the North um, Carolina Nature Nature Conservancy developed some guidance materials that are available online, and they they really do kind of talk about using disturbed, degraded, marginal lands. Um, and, and really trying to avoid areas of high diversity, biodiversity, high quality natural areas. Um, so, you know, the goal really is to avoid prime farmlands and mature forests uh, with those particular projects. Um, and, and we do have concerns on the, just the imp potential impact on forest tracks, you know, particularly in the Northern tier as they have close proximity to some of the high voltage transmission uh, corridors. So, you know, we're working you know, obviously we're working to increase our forest canopy um, and clear cutting large swaths of mature forest for solar doesn't result in the increase in carbon sequestration. So you're sacrificing one for another. Um, when you remove large swaths of mature forest, you're also eliminating the beneficial carbon sinks that are already contributing to climate mitigation. Uh, certainly it's, it's far more beneficial 
has been stated over and over again uh, to site large systems on marginal lands that do not contribute significantly to carbon sequestration. Uh, you know, as on DCNR forest, uh, DCNR forest lands, you know, we're we're looking at selective timbering and sustainable forestry practices that really allow for continued forest growth um, and succession. It supports new growth, which can include rapid rates of carbon sequestration, but also allows for that existing canopy to continue offsetting uh, the carbon. Uh, forested lands also offer a multitude of benefits, um, air quality, water, water quality, flood and stormwater management, biodiversity. Um, so there's other reasons why we want to keep them intact as well. And certainly taking large swaths of agricultural or forested lands out of production could have significant adverse impacts on the local and the state economy. So we have concerns from a resource perspective, from a climate mitigation perspective, and from an economic impact perspective. And so finally, I'll just note that the power is really in the hands of the municipalities, the landowners, the investors, the developers. 71% uh, of our state's forest lands are privately owned and managed. And so we really just want to make sure that those decision makers have good information and are making the best decisions, especially landowners, making the best decisions for themselves and for their lands. Uh, certainly, as been noted, municipalities need good model ordinances and land use guidance uh, to ensure that they are making the best decisions for their communities. And DCNR is working on the development of best practices and guidance. We're we're having conversations with our key stakeholders. We presented to our internal uh, uh, EMAC, which is the Ecological Management Advisory Committee, and now CONRAC. We're hoping to get um, to, to bring in information and then have something that folks can can review um, in in the near future. And I will stop there. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Um, do we have any questions for Robert or Nicole at this time? Let's open it up. Hey, this is Greg. Um, a great presentation is very uh, enlightening. Thank you, Robert. On your slide deck, um, uh, slide 18, could you just go back? I think it was slide 18. I just wanted to see that again. It went fast. One more back. Yeah, that was one I was interested in. So where's the, oh, and so the grid scale solar deployment, that's basically, it's 10% of, 10% of what exactly? This is all of DCNR's um, managed acreage or what exactly? Oh, I'm sorry, oh, that 10% in relation to if 10% of the Commonwealth's energy generation was coming from solar, um, coming from grid scale oh, solar. Oh, I see. Okay. Yep. Good, good. And then the, and then the 80,000 acres compares to, I was just sort of trying to look, there's a lot of information here. It's pretty interesting. And I was just kind of, there's a lot of information in your whole presentation, but I was just trying to, I thought this was a very interesting slide. Sure. sure. So the, the 80,000 was that number that came out of the Finding Gay Solar Future Plan. Um, that assumption if um, using that eight acres per megawatt, if 90%, this is a lot of percentages of percentages, but basically if the goal by 2030 to get to 10% of the state's energy generation coming from solar, if the high end of that came from grid scale installations as opposed to rooftop and other, and, and you know, smaller installations, you know, th that kind of back of the envelope um, calculation was about 80,000 acres. So that's where that 80,000 number came from. Got it. And of course, there's, you know, more about, you know, when and where and all of that. And that's, I guess, kind of what a little bit more what Nicole was, you know, was talking about. And the idea here being, you know, how to you know, manage this in a way that isn't taking out existing uh, old growth forest, but is the right reuse or the right use for uh, you know, for those acreages, the, that acreage versus, you know, just sort of developer oriented convenience. Correct. Yeah, I think that's you. the question you were saying, you know, I know this is kind of dense. I have, I have provided this to, to the, to DCNR to distribute to the committee as well. If, 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 if um, following, if, 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 if any of the members would like a copy of this um, presentation. 
Okay. Great. Are there any other questions for Nicole or Robert at this point? Okay. Well, thank you. That was a very in depth presentation and very good. So thank you for sharing that with us today. Okay. With that, we're going to move on to our work group reports. Um, and while I'm on here, I'll just go ahead and give a quick update regarding the infrastructure work group. Uh, as I noted earlier, we did send our letter to Governor Wolf and the Gen General Assembly asking that American Rescue Plan funds be allocated for state park and state forest infrastructure needs. That went out. And also, the second thing that we are working on uh, as a work group is our second CONRAC conversations. I think some of you participated in our first one, which was diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and it went extremely well and had a great dialogue among people around the issue. And um, we're hoping to have a similar type format for our CONRAC conversations regarding infrastructure. Our date for that is going to be October 21st, and we will be getting more information out shortly. We're finalizing our title and, and some of the details that go with that um, Conrad conversation. So hold tight on that one. All right, moving on, I'd like to turn it over to Bob. Do you have any updates or comments for the motorized recreation work group? Bob is our chair. Uh, I just uh, like to thank Chris for his presentation this morning. Learned quite a bit about the pilot project. Looking forward to the upcoming webinars. Uh, other than that, we have not met, and so I have no uh, no report to provide. But thank you. Okay, thank you, Bob. Uh, next is communications and outreach, which is chaired by Sarah Hall Bagdonis. Sarah, anything on your end by way of update? Um, just a short report here. Um, I really just wanted to thank Katrina again for sending out a great newsletter um, for this meeting. And I also wanted to um, just say that we are assisting the infrastructure work group um, in any way we can for the next Conrad conversations, and we're happy to collaborate on that effort. And we, we're looking forward to it. So I think that's all for me. Thank you. All right. Thanks. And we appreciate your help with that as well. Um, I don't think Joanne is with us, but diversity, equity, and inclusion work group. Okay, and I know um, after having their CONRAC conversations, they are meeting as a group and we'll be just discussing next steps and how CONRAC might bring um, the equity lens more regularly to uh, meeting agendas from that end. Okay. And last, but certainly not least, we have Meredith Graham. Meredith, I don't know if you have any updates on your end that you would like to share with us at this time for the strategic planning work group. I don't, Gerilyn, but I will say thank you to Katrina and the council for helping us get out the comment letter on the proposed changes to the state's uh, science education standards. So thanks everybody for helping to move that quickly. Yeah, and, and thank you. We, Meredith has a new addition to her family. So in the midst of all of her helping uh, with strategic planning and leading that charge, she also has a new new little girl. So congratulations, Meredith, and thanks for helping us out through all of that. Thank you. Okay, so now we are back to our second public comment period on our agenda. And I do think we have one individual, Randy Green, that um, would like to share or say a few words. And again, just keeping it to five minutes or less. And then we'll also swing back and see if Stephen Lane uh, has resolved his issues with um, either his phone or whatever and is able to hear us from that end. So, but Randy, are you available?
Uh, yes, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to hold uh, my questions and comments till the uh, August 25th um, report by Chris on the uh, pilot ATV program. I'll, I'll just wait till then. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, and our, if we can, we'll try to reach back to Stephen Lane. I don't know if we can unmute him and see All if right. he can hear us and if we can hear him. Is I that Stephen? Yeah, this is me, Geraldine. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. Somebody had mentioned using Teams. I think what happened, I use Teams all day long, and I think it conflicted with my speakers for um, for the WebEx. So thank you very much. I apologize for um, not having that right. So I'd like to read a prepared statement that I had also sent along um, to you, and um, we'll leave it at that. So to the council members, my name is Stephen Lane Sr., and I reside at Tumatisse Drive, Downingtown, Pennsylvania, 19335. I would like to thank you for allowing me to address the council firsthand here today of accounts of mistreatment by the hands of Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Department of Conservation and Natural Resource, TCNR officials, seeking to harass, intimidate, bully, and extort neighbors and landowners whose property adjoins property owned and managed by the DCNR. I am one of those that has experienced this illegal treatment personally. I would like to respectfully request that this council commit to arranging a public hearing in which we would hear other accounts of mistreatment of Pennsylvania citizens who have been subjected to abusive behaviors by DCNR officials. These firsthand accounts will give the victims of abusive conduct by DCNR officials a chance to tell their story to members of our state legislature and other concerned citizens and third parties. Their testimony will show the status quo agency oversight policies and procedures are inadequate for addressing or deterring employee abuses and may instead embolden overreaching or malicious employee behavior with little risk of retribution for their actions. In many cases, citizens who refuse to surrender their constitutional rights have been subject to a pattern and practice of threats and intimidation. The employees of the DCNR, through individual and collective efforts, are actively using land designations and restrictions to curtail multiple use on Commonwealth lands. Residents of properties adjoining state lands have been subjected to threats, lack of cooperation, and numerous unfair and heavy-handed tactics which threaten the public safety and threaten the livelihoods of communities, especially those that adjoin Commonwealth public land. These actions are creating unnecessary tension with individual citizens, state and local units of government, and even local law enforcement. Pennsylvania legislator oversight and legislative solutions are necessary to provide an effective check on DCNR officials who abuse their regulatory powers. Today's request for this hearing will continue the council's work to fashion a legislative solution that will give targets of abuse by the DCNR employees the opportunity to seek a just remedy. I thank you for your time today, and I look forward to working with you to schedule this public hearing soon. Thank you. Thank you for your comments today. Um, we. As I mentioned earlier, we're not going to engage in a dialogue or discussion at this time, but we will be reviewing this information and discussing the appropriate follow up and response. So, th thank you for for your time today. Okay, with that. Um, I think that is everyone that we had wanting to provide comments is that. Correct. Has anything come up since I've since we started the meeting? Era or Gretchen, I don't know if there was anybody else or did we get everybody? There was one other, a Dave Gessie, but I don't see him in my list anymore. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, with that, 
our next meeting will be Wednesday, September 22nd. And if all goes well, we will be back in the Rachel Carson State Office building in room 105 and probably having a combination of some virtual component as well as our in person meeting. So, very much looking forward to that. And thank you all for your patience through this. This was our eighth WebEx meeting, and all of them have gone extremely well. Today has been a little more challenging, but I think as Commonwealth staff are getting back in the building and technology and people's technology on their end, we, we did hit a couple little bumps today, but appreciate your patience and time with us and, and thank you for, for joining us today. I'll turn it over to either Gretchen or anyone that might have any additional closing comments at this point. Thanks, Gerilyn. I will just echo what Gerilyn said. Thank you all for joining us today. We had a good number of people listening in. Uh, I did note that there are some questions in the chat that we will collect for the council members so they can address them uh, and get back to the folks that did ask questions. Uh, uh, again, uh, we do, fingers crossed, hope to be back at a hybrid setting, uh, allowing people to come into the Rachel Carson building and council members to see each other in person in September. Uh, so we look forward to that and uh, we appreciate, as always, your interest in DCNR and the Advisory Council and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Please say, stay, stay, stay safe uh, and be well. Thanks. Thanks, Gretchen. Have a good day, everyone.